We're now from Capitol Hill. Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, member of the Finance and Foreign Relations Committee. So, Senator, welcome back. Great to have you here. Good morning, David. Thanks we're, for having me on. We're, hear, we're hearing different things. We heard Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, say it was productive. We hear from the acting chief of staff, boy, we may have to walk away. Do you have a sense of where things stand right now? Well, the reports I'm hearing is that the meetings were productive, and in fact, they're talking about a schedule of reducing the tariffs, which is a good thing. Uh, we've still got big issues with China, as you know, not just on the trade deficit, but also on subsidies and also on protecting intellectual property. So my, my hope is that, you know, these talks will result not just in rebalancing our trade, where there's a big deficit, but also dealing with some of these structural problems that have caused some of the imbalance. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I, I think being willing to walk away is always important, particularly in tough negotiations like this one. But my, my hope is we'll be able to make progress. As you talk about some of the structural issues, such as intellectual property, we have uh, reports out today, one in the Financial Times, one in the, one in the New York Times, saying that the president may be backing off some requirements about intellectual property, about data handling. If you were to really uh, uh, evaluate it right now, now, is the bigger risk that we don't get a deal or that we do a deal that's too easy for China? Uh, I don't think Bob Lighthizer, uh, or Steve Mnuchin for that matter, but particularly Lighthizer, who's pretty tough on these issues, including the intellectual property issues, are, are going to agree to a deal that doesn't have some structural changes. And let me give you a few examples. One, of course, is the uh, requirement that there be joint ventures. In other words, that when American companies go to China, often they're required to have a 51% Chinese partner. That's pretty simple to fix. And what happens is then the IP tends to get transferred to the Chinese company. Uh, those same intellectual property problems exist in other ways, too including licensing agreements that are required. So it's not just the hacking, which we know about, uh, which is maybe more difficult for uh, China as a government to stop because some of that is, is private, but it's all these other legal and procedural and uh, regulatory issues that are in place in China. So I think that can be handled, and I think it should be, and I think China is not just uh, creating issues for U.S. companies, but also other companies around the globe. I was just in Southeast Asia talking to other countries in the region who have very similar concerns. Uh, you were trade representative of the United States of America, so you've negotiated these deals. If you were in Bob Lighthizer's shoes right now, Ambassador Lighthizer's shoes, would you keep some or all the tariffs in place as part of the enforcement mechanism? Uh, I think in order to get the best deal possible, it's going to be required to remove the tariffs that are currently in place, including the tariffs on the $200 billion uh, uh, that was put on more recently. Uh, but you should have an agreement that says that those can be reimposed immediately. I mean, that's, that's the consequence. So I think to get the right agreement, I think you reduce the tariffs uh, immediately, uh, even eliminate them over a period of time. And then I think you have the ability to reimpose those tariffs should there, should there be a problem. I know there's been discussion of keeping tariffs in place. Uh, I don't think that that will result in uh, as uh, productive uh, 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 negotiation or as good a deal for the United States. Uh, another subject that's very much on the agenda these days, including just yesterday, is infrastructure. We had the Democratic leadership of the House and the Senate go up and meet with the President of the United States, come out and tell us they've agreed to a $2 trillion price tag for this. They're going to take three weeks to figure out how to pay for it. You were not only trade representative, you were actually director of OMB. You managed the budget. How could we pay for a, a bill that's that high? Well, it depends uh, how that money is uh, supposed to be found. We've been trying, of course, for a couple of years now to find uh, $1.5 trillion unsuccessfully, so finding two would, would seem to be harder. But there are different ways to do it. I mean, if you assume, as an example, that we could change the way we permit projects to speed up the actual implementation of infrastructure projects, which is one of the huge problems right now. As you know, it can take six, seven, eight years for us to actually have a project uh, come to fruition. That's a huge cost savings. Uh, so if you could add that to the mix, uh, getting to that magic uh, $2 trillion number, there are other ways to do it, obviously, using some tax incentives. Um, there's other ways to do it, uh, using some of the state and local um, options that are out there where the U.S. government could act as a partner and maybe provide some incentives. So. It could be cobbled together, I suppose, to come up with a $2 trillion number, but it isn't going to be a $2 trillion appropriation. The money's not in the budget for that. There's not the pay for us for that. And frankly, we're already in a deficit situation. I don't think most Republicans or Democrats will be willing to simply add that to the deficit. Senator, we're very mindful of Venezuela right now. As we had these developments yesterday, it's a little hard to know exactly what went on. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of demonstrating. What do you know about what's happening? And as important, perhaps more important, what should the United States be doing or not doing in that situation? Well, first, uh, I, I commend the people of Venezuela for being strong, for you know staying out on the street, and for aspiring for freedom and democracy. That's the key. 
in the last 24 hours, as I understand it, David, uh, there has not been a successful transition of power. In other words, Guaido is staying in power, largely because of his Cuban and, and Russian uh, supporters who are there with him. Maduro. Uh, some members of the military have, have not you know, been willing to come over to the side of the people. However, I think it's heading in the right direction. I think the United States government needs to continue to support Guaido, continue to support, again, the legitimate aspirations of the people. Recall that under their constitution, uh, their parliament is able, when there's a sham election, as there was, to take the step of appointing a president, and they did that. So this is constitutionally in keeping with their government, and therefore it's not a coup. It's the rightful uh, transition of power that ought to occur. The other thing we need to do is continue to use our allies. We have allies in the region who are supporting us strongly. Uh, there are a few who could do some more, um, but there are, there are people now around the world who are looking at this and realizing that this is not you know, a, a coup, it's not the United States uh, imposing anything on the Venezuelan people, it's the Venezuelan people themselves who are standing up. Uh, by the way, some of them are also voting with their feet and leaving the country mm -hmm. uh, you know, by the uh, you know, two, three million people. So that's certainly a, a sign that, that the current government is not serving the people. Yeah, a lot of suffering going on down there in Venezuela. Senator, thank you so very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. That's Thanks, Republican Senator Appreciate. Rob Portman of Ohio.